the bright sun up above and the clear blue sky stood out as a strange contrast to the dark cloud that I saw ahead in the wall of water that began this terrible storm. To the person I was on the phone with, I said, it looks pretty bad up ahead, I better let you go. And I hoped I didn't sound too awkward being too abrupt, but it did look like I needed all my faculties to concentrate. As I got onto the Capitol Beltway, the water started hitting the car and I had no way to get out of what was ahead. This was on Thursday. You know, it's not good form to start out a sermon talking about the weather, <laughs> but it serves a purpose today. It was on Thursday. And I had no idea how bad it was about to be. Suddenly, the rain is falling in buckets. I've heard that expression my whole life. I've never understood what it meant. Windshield wipers on full blast. It was doing nothing at all to help me see. At one, frankly, very scary point, I came to a full stop in the middle of the interstate, not being able to see in front of me or ahead of me if anyone else was doing the same or not. I braced to see whether I would get hit from behind or when I started going again, if uh, this might happen again, whether I, I might run into someone myself. There wasn't a good shoulder to pull onto and frankly, I wouldn't have felt safe there either. It was coming down, I was crawling along about 10 miles an hour and I just felt I had to keep going. I don't know that I can think of another time really where I have feared for my life in the way that I did during this. Because not only was there rain, the wind was ripping leaves off the trees. I was certain that if I could see better, I would see a tornado nearby. It felt that way. Lightning, when I say lightning crashed down around me, literally within a couple hundred feet this side of the interstate, wham, crashed down. Then on the other side, again. I literally I cried out to God, get me through this. <laughs> and I, I even chuckled a little bit because I was nervous, I was afraid. Uh, I didn't know how it was gonna turn out. You know, there's, there's no guarantee on our human life. People more faithful than me, servants of God, have died throughout, uh, you know, all, all time in all kinds of different ways, sometimes tragically. I was worried. I did want to stop and say thanks for the special music, by the way, Evie. That was a beautiful song. It's the kind of song that could get you through a storm, I would think. It was, it was a very comforting melody. I appreciated that. I was thinking about this kind of, bit, you know, I had, nobody died in the storm that I'm aware of, but it felt like a brush with death. Certainly saw, uh, you know, my own fragility in it. I was thinking about the sermon topic for this week. Bible prophecy reveals terrible, terrible storms ahead before the return of Christ. There are going to be a number of difficulties. An oppressive government system that will overtake the entire world, known as the beast. For the physical descendants of Israel, there are prophecies of their punishment, which will be very severe. There are storms ahead specifically for the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem at the end time being surrounded by armies, but also and our focus today is the intense persecution that will come on the church in the end. I think about my time in the church of God, which has not been long compared to many of you, but I think that there is a tendency for us to rely on or look to being taken away to the place of safety. As though you know, the truly faithful are going to just waltz right out on all the difficulties of the world without a care when the end time comes. And something is missing from that picture that we really need to be aware of. Sometimes we see that as a guaranteed protection from the, the coming prophetic storm, but really, if we look, we'll take our Bibles and go to Daniel chapter seven, the church of God is right in the middle of the storm, up to a point. Daniel chapter seven. We'll start in verse 21. Daniel is receiving this vision of this terrible beast that's trampling the nations. 
represents the Roman Empire, as we understand. I believe I discussed that in a sermon. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but it was, it was way back in December of last year, so ages ago. But Daniel's describing this, and what you see as prophecy gets towards the end is the different lenses of prophecy begin to overlap. They begin to interact, all these different pieces. So here we see the fate of the church come into contact with the beast, the political system. I was watching, verse 21, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. The horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 23, he's seeing this vision again. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. It shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. And in verse 25, it shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. And then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time. Turn with me over to Daniel 11. Daniel 11 is a chapter where we see, again, multiple lenses of prophecy in view at the same time. Verse 32 through 35 describes the time when the king of the north will sweep into the glorious land, it says. But before it talks about the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and that part of it, verse 32 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he, that is, this leader, shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people who know their God... That would refer to the church, just as in Daniel 7, the saints, referring to God's people, the church in the end times. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. God's church is one of the major focal points of end time prophecy. God loves us. He loves his people. He loves his church. He, he shows care and concern for every one of us daily. You know, he heard me when I cried out to him in this storm that I was going through. He hears us with every affliction that we call out to him uh, for, everything. And he has this wonderful plan for us. He's preparing us to be his beloved children, to give us eternal life so we can live with him forever. So it's no wonder, since these things are coming, he wants us to know and be ready, be prepared for the difficulties ahead so that we can endure through them, knowing that it's part of the plan. So today we want to review what prophecy reveals about what the church of God will face in the end time. Here in Daniel, we've kind of set the stage. There's more detail given in other places that we'll look at. And there's lessons for us that we need to take away and put into practice. In the wide view, what we've already seen a little bit of and what we can say with certainty is that some of God's church will be killed, both before as well as during the Great Tribulation. And none of us is promised to live through that time of testing. But if we want eternal life, if we want victory through Jesus Christ, we can be assured of that. It's going to require us to give up everything, even our own lives. Let's talk about this promised persecution coming and also the promised protection. The persecution precedes the protection of the church and the great tribulation. Again, we don't want to get so caught up in the protection that we, we miss the fact that the devastating persecution comes first. We'll read about this in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. In Matthew 24 is where we find Jesus Christ preaching from the Mount of Olives, one of his longest prophecies, known as the Olivet Prophecy, named after the mountain. And we'll pick it up in verse 9. The disciples had asked what would be the sign of Christ's coming and of the end of the age, and Christ began, began explaining some of the awful things that would happen. Now, for the first several verses, he's describing pestilence, famines, earthquakes, scary-sounding stuff, but verse 8 says that these are just the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginning of sorrows. 
So when the beginning of sorrows is done, then what happens? Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. It's pretty heavy. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We talked about that a few months ago, about false prophets and that mystery of lawlessness that's also weaved into what's coming. But verse 13, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now notice this is prior to the great tribulation. The great tribulation appears in verse 21. We'll read verse 21 and verse 22 as well. For then, it talks about the abomination of a desolation. That's what I'm skipping over in the intervening verses. Then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. This is where we get the term great tribulation. It's the great tribulation. It's, it's the worst that there's ever been or ever will be. Like a storm you see coming and you, you don't really have anywhere to go or anything you can do except keep driving into it. Before the great tribulation though, we don't want to gloss over what we read in verse nine, that the church will be facing a type of persecution that involves people being put to death. This correlates, in fact, we'll um, go to Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9, this correlates with the fifth seal, the fifth seal of Revelation. Revelation describes the same prophetic events in, with slightly different images, different angles to, to tell us about, and different imagery. The first four seals involve the four horsemen, with various um, plagues that'll come on the earth and afflictions. But verse nine, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony, which they held. And again, this has been going on since the church has been founded. Many of the apostles even were, were martyred. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. That is, there were more who were going to, to die, to be martyred at the end time, preceding the final events of Jesus Christ's return. You know, when we read in Matthew 24, 9, you'll be hated by all nations for my sake. Hated by all nations. You know, right now, at the national level, most nations don't even know who we are, necessarily. When this persecution comes at the hand of the beast, this is going to be a way that the gospel goes out, which is why it follows up in that same section. We saw it in verse 14, that the gospel would be preached to all nations. We even saw that back in Daniel, glossed over it in chapter 11, but it said, the wise shall instruct many. The whole world will hear about God's true church and it'll be major news because we're going to be intensely hated and hunted for the way of life that God has called us to. The critical advice in Matthew 24, we can turn back there since I keep referencing it. I think I'd meant to go back to it. Matthew 24. The key advice was found in verse 13. He who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures what? And he who endures to what end? How long, in other words? Just like uh, we read that, that cry in Revelation 6, how long? How long? Well, as, as we've already seen and remarked, many throughout the ages have already died for their testimony of Jesus Christ and for keeping the commandments of God. That was the end they had to endure till, and for some, the end of our human life 
will be how far we have to endure. Others may live until the return of Christ, maybe even some of us. That's the end that those must endure too. Neither one is going to be easy. We read verse 22, a key promise that we want to make note of here. The key promise, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved alive. That is, mankind would be on the brink of destroying itself and would do so, in fact, so that no flesh was saved alive except for the elect's sake. That is, for the sake of the church of God, for the sake of us and, and all of God's people. These things will be put to an end. That, that's a promise. It ties into the same promise. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that Christ made. We can take comfort in that. It's still going to be difficult. We have to know and remember, first of all, that God's saints being put to death is part of the plan. It's been part of the plan uh, all the way back to the time of Christ. In fact, the death of Christ, his suffering. We have to know that when that happens... It doesn't mean that God is punishing the church. And it doesn't mean that God is punishing those individuals who give their lives. God wasn't punishing the apostles when some of them were martyred. Many of them, in fact. Most of them. Peter, Paul, James. Take your pick of them. Let's turn over to Luke's account of this same prophecy, the Olivet Prophecy, in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, we get just a few different details in Luke's account of the same prophecy. Luke 21 and verse 16. And this is going back to um, that sense of being hated by the nations. We get a little more detail here. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. This really personalizes things beyond just being hated by the nations. Okay, being hated by all. Possibly being hated by our own family members and friends. Continuing to verse 18. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. By your patience possess your souls. This is the equivalent in Luke's account of um, those who endure to the end shall be saved. You know, looking at family members delivering people up to be, to be killed, we, we have, many of us have family members or at least friends who are not part of the church. And sometimes we, we can have some difficulties if we first come into the church and start doing things differently. And I, I know a lot of us have had those experiences where it's, Sometimes there's some friction, uh, but, it, you know, having an argument over why I'm not there on Christmas Eve is, is not persecution. <laughs> that it, it's just not. Um, mo mostly what we, we deal with with our family right now is some awkwardness, <laughs> maybe some hard feelings, some adjusting as a family, and, and coming to an understanding with extended family over those types of issues. This is different. This is intensified by external pressure, pressure that will be applied by the beast, this world ruling government system. And it's under that pressure where, who knows, maybe people even under threat of their own life and through deception are going to deliver up God's saints to be killed. I mean, I, I can't imagine that that's a trial for a person in that position, too. They feel like their life is on the line, a terrible position to be put in. And, and who knows? Can you, can you imagine? I mean, I, I think about my own family. Could, could one of them come to me and say, look, I know you do this stuff you're involved with. it. You need to give this up or else you're, you're going to end up this way. You know, when they're being in, interrogated, possibly, being asked, do you know anyone who does this or that? It's scary to think about. Very scary to think about. You know, this admonition that Luke gives here, it's translated in the New King James a little awkwardly, more so than uh, in Matthew's gospel. By your patience, possess your souls. That word patience is different um, form of the same root word for enduring that Matthew gave. And other translations uh, put this, by endurance, you will gain your lives. By endurance, you will gain your lives. 
Look down at verse 34. After he had finished um, giving the prophetic words, Christ gave this admonition. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We can't afford to not prepare now. We have to be doing the work. I mean, how, how can we possibly prepare for a persecution and a test of this magnitude? So uh, some practical instruction there. That don't spend our lives just fooling around with things that don't matter, things that don't profit. You know, avoiding drunkenness, of carousing, the cares of this life, and not giving attention to our spiritual life. It doesn't mean we can't have fun, obviously. We can, we can have fun. We can rejoice before God. But we have to be able to do that within the context of living a godly life, not being pulled away by sin and just distracting ourselves endlessly. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 27. This is how we prepare for such an unimaginable, unthinkable trial that's going to come. Yes, we need to be, be getting our lives together. We need to be praying that we be counted worthy to escape those things, even though we know that to some extent that's out of our hands. God will decide who's, uh, who's involved in this persecution or, or not, just like I could have been struck by lightning on the road the other day. All kinds of things can happen. We have to prepare to not give up to the beast, and we do that by giving up to God right now. Giving up to God right now. Matthew 10 and verse 27, we read, Matthew 10, verse 27. Christ said, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. That idea that in the end times, the gospel would be preached, that the people of God, the wise will instruct many. The people of God will be living God's way and not ashamed to say so. Not ashamed to say what we believe is right and true and good. When the whole world goes off the rails and is saying something different and commanding us to do something different. We have a responsibility as a church and as individuals to preach the gospel, a living example of faith. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Seeing this, our fear of God has to be greater than the fear of anything that man can do to us, even when the things that man can do are very scary indeed. According to the flesh, that is. You know, after laying that down, Christ goes on the next few verses to describe how God takes care over every sparrow, right? Cheap, insignificant bird. Every single sparrow, not one, falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. Verse 30, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I mean, God knows us intimately. He cares about us deeply. He pays attention to every little detail of us. God knows about our suffering. He's not blind to us. He sees us. He cares about us, and he has a plan to deliver us from death. Which death? The ultimate death. The ultimate death. God has a plan to give us eternal life, and that's going to be in his time, and it's on a condition. The condition being, again, that we must totally give up our life to him. Verse 32, we'll pick it up. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him also I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Although they have these verses, really, if you follow along this section, it has a lot of parallels with Matthew 24 and Luke 21, the Olivet Prophecy, more from a personalized instruction to the church. This seems to be, if we're in some kind of test, where we have to either confess or deny Christ before others, we better be confessing Christ. Seems like Christ is warning that points like that will come, and indeed they will. Verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So it's starting to sound like Luke 21. Being delivered up by, by others, being hated by those outside the church because of our beliefs. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What did it say in Luke 21? Pray that you are counted worthy to escape all these things. Who is worthy? It's those who love God the Father and Jesus Christ above every other thing in our life. So the question we have to ask is, have we really done this? Are we really living this? Another good reference to this that I won't turn to is Luke chapter 14. This section is kind of Matthew's version of counting the cost. Counting the cost. That's something we discuss as part of baptism counseling. And when we, when we make that commitment then, this is what we commit to. This is what we mean by it. We mean that if it comes down to a choice between anything physical, whether that's our human family or best friend, wh whatever it is, between that and God, we'll choose God every time and without hesitation. Verse 38 says, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of, of me. In Luke's account, in, verse, uh, in Luke chapter 14, it says we have to take up our cross daily. We have to do it daily. This is not a one-time affirmation of the way of God that we take on at baptism. But this has to be part of how we live our lives every single day. And it has to be continually refreshed and renewed for us. We have to live it. We have to live out repentance daily. Just like repentance goes along with baptism as something we do. We, we, for that one time, declare that we have forsaken everything against God. But then we have to go through a lifetime of living that out. Actually living that out. And being picked up when we stumble and continuing on in the way even though it's hard. Verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. It's kind of a cryptic statement at first glance. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That for my sake in the second clause reveals what Christ is talking about there. If you're finding your life, that is, if you are spending your time and energy seeking after the flesh, seeking after physical things, you're going to lose it. And that word lose in Greek, really, lose is kind of a weak translation here for it. It means destroy. He'll destroy his life. We can destroy our eternal life by not being diligent over our physical life. We can disqualify ourselves just by what Luke 21, 34 said, blowing it on pleasures drunkenness and carousing, delaying to do that work of repentance and overcoming sin, not taking it seriously when we have time to take it seriously. Because we don't know when these things will come, and we don't want it to hit us unexpectedly where we're unprepared. You know, that can also fit into this same example, this specific singular point, a defining moment of testing where you might be asked if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Or if you keep the commandments of God, being ready to answer yes, even, even when your life is on the line, has to be present. If we've made the commitment, if we really made the commitment to God, it'll endure through that. When it says whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That for my sake makes all the difference. We have to count our love for God so far above everything else that it's not even close. So far that we would give our, our family relationships, even our, our own life, our own physical life that is, giving it up completely. When we talk about counting the cost like this, God requires one thing from every person. Everything we have. 
That's all, that's all he wants. <laughs> all God wants is everything we have. And it has to be. It can't be anything less than that. It just won't do. It's not just our time on the Sabbath that God wants. God has to own and possess all of our time. No, that doesn't mean we're only ever praying and Bible study and then go back to sleep and, and eat and do the, the necessary, necessary things. But it means that all of our time has to glorify God. All of it. We can't give any time over to other things that don't glorify God. He wants all of our time. He doesn't just want the tithe that we give. God has to be glorified in how we use all of our money. All of our time. All of our money. How about like we heard about in the sermon ed? Not just the way that we love those who love us, but God requires that we love our enemies, all people. Not having that equal and opposite reaction, but giving everything in the way that God would want, fulfilling his will at every point. Not just looking at our behavior in public, but that we avoid sin all the time, when no one but God would know about it, when it seemed like we could get away with it. This is what is intended and meant by the great commandment, the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It means we have to be busy giving everything that we have, bringing every thought into captivity, not holding anything back from God, and endeavoring to do that every day. So if we understand that this is what is necessary for every person, that's true whether you are delivered up to be killed or whether you live a long, happy, fulfilling life and go peacefully in your sleep. This is what's required. The requirement is no different. So now let's turn to Revelation chapter 12 and talk about God's protection on the church through the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is an extended vision of a woman. There's another woman. There are two women in the book of Revelation. The other one I talked about in the other sermon I referenced uh, is the great false church that will wield sway over all the people of the world that will, will be enjoined with the political system of the beast. This woman is the church of God. We see in Revelation 12 and verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. And you know, hearing, hearing those things, the sun, moon, 12 stars, sounds very much like a dream that Joseph had back in Genesis 37. I won't turn there, but it's not exactly the same. We, we may remember that story. Joseph has the dream of the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. Right? He had a, a physical dream about his physical family that would, that would take place after he had gone into Egypt. But the symbolism there, these are lights. The people of God, the light of the world, in fact. And this woman is clothed with the light. Right? And the symbols, uh, the, the symbols of, uh, of Israel there being a part of that, part of the adornment of the woman, is certainly there, certainly valid. In Romans, um, uh, I'll just give the reference in Romans 4 and verse 16, we're told and reminded that it's those who are of the faith of Abraham that are saved, God, that God is the God of those who are descendants of Abraham, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. Like I covered in the Bible study a few weeks ago in uh, Romans chapter 9, they are not all Israel who are born of Israel. It's God's spiritual people that matter here. That's the woman. Verse 2, then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. This is giving birth to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So we're seeing kind of a condensed version of history. God has had his people he's been working with all the way back to Abraham. We follow their story through the nation of Israel, through the exile of the nation of Israel, Israel through the exile of the nation of Judah, through the return of a remnant of Judah, down to the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's what's described here. Continuing down in verse 4. 
Um, well, I, I should read verse 3 or we're not going to understand verse 4. <laughs> Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. We, we see this again in Romans chapter 13, uh, sorry, Revelation 13, where the beast is being described. This is Satan the devil, who is the power and orchestrator behind the beast. That fiery red dragon. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. That being a reference to Herod's attempt to destroy Jesus Christ while he was still just a child, which is why uh, Mary, Joseph, and, and Jesus, Jesus fled down to Egypt after he was born and then returned after Herod's death. Verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God at his throne. So again, Jesus Christ being born to that, um, you, know, you could say the, the remnant of Judah at this point, the remnant of Judah. It was a physical remnant of those who had returned, the descendants uh, of Abraham through Judah, but also a spiritual remnant, those who were faithful to God's covenant, who had continued in it. People like Mary and Joseph, who were faithful to God in, in everything, like John the Baptist and his family, like the many who would be converted after Christ's death, who would come into the church. Most of Israel and Judah, again, we note, had already been rejected by this time. The tribes of Israel had already been deported to Assyria and had been scattered among the nations for hundreds of years by this time. Looking at verse 5 and 6, we see her child was caught up to God and his throne. Okay, so that's Jesus Christ after his death and resurrection ascending into heaven where God is. And then, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness. This woman, again, I'll say it again, is, is the church of God. Fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. 1,260 days. One quick, quick thing to note here. Uh, we, we do not, as a church, believe in the rapture, that the church will be taken to heaven to escape the tribulation. We are about to talk about the protection on God's church through the tribulation, but if we just notice here, if you need just one more quick argument in your arsenal, notice in verse 5, the child was caught up to God in his throne. Where did the woman go? Into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. Not up to heaven or not taken um, off of the earth, but taken into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Now, when we come down a little bit further, down to um, pass, there's an interlude in verses 7 through 11 about a war in heaven, the dragon being cast down. And then in verse 14, we see a similar, uh, a similar statement, the woman being given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So verse 6 and verse 14 Two ways this could go. They could be describing the same interval of time. 1260 days is the same as three and a half years, which is what time, times, and half a time means. That could be. It looks like things, there may be some things that happen in between here, though. So it's difficult to tell if these are, in fact, two separate events. If I can just comment on that, one interpretation is that they are, in fact, separate times that the church would be protected. That verse 6, the 1,260 days being written out explicitly that way instead of summarized as time, time, and half a time, uh, being written out that way, that it's in fact referring to a, uh, in the Bible sometimes in prophecy, there's a day for a year principle. All right, so looking at instead of this just being a literal number of days, that these are 1,260 years. And that that would have began sometime around the reign of Constantine over the Roman Empire. Why around the reign of Constantine? Where did anybody get that idea? Constantine, under his rule in the Roman Empire in the 300s AD, is when, due to his efforts and making it the official religion of the state, all other expressions of the Christian faith were squeezed out. In other words, it became impossible for the church to remain functioning in society. Basically, the church had to go into hiding. 
And it's not until about 1,200 years later, when you come into the 1500s, when within the Western world you have the opening up of religious freedom in a way that had not been possible because of the stranglehold of the Catholic Church uh, over the Western world for all of that intervening time. In the Protestant Reformation, the freedom of religion in the Western world became possible again. With the founding of America as part of that, because you know, there was a lot of violence in Europe, even among different Protestant sects, God's church not being part of the Protestant churches, but having certainly been in the world for all this time. Again, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. But the church couldn't really be visible because it was squashed, put into the margins of history until about this time when they could practice freely. And later, as God's church slowly emerges out of, out of the shadows, you could say, it was established powerfully in America. The, this is something that ties in with another one of those lenses of prophecy and the understanding that we've had in the Church of God that Britain and America, these two countries, are the, the tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph. If you look back in Genesis 48 at the promises that one would become a great nation, the other a great company of nations, they happen to arise in this way, you know, Britain and America as, as brother nations at a time in history that's feeling closer and closer to the end. And it happens to be where the church of God emerges at a time when religious freedom is, um, is now possible again. It, it all just sinks together and fits together in a certain way. So that's one explanation of the 1,260 days in verse 6. Maybe refers to what has already happened. But nevertheless, and God has protected and sustained the church through the ages from the time of Christ till now, whether that's uh, the correct interpretation of that or not. But nevertheless, we see this great tribulation that's going to last for about three and a half years involves another protection of the church. The woman either in conjunction with that or again goes into a place that's prepared in the wilderness. Let's back up just a little bit to verse 12. Verse 12, I mentioned the war in heaven that breaks out, Satan and the, the uh, demons being cast down to the earth, not allowed to come into heaven in the presence of God any longer. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. That is God and the angels rejoicing. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. This is going to be a change for the people on earth and for the sea. A change. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. This is something that takes place in the end time leading up to these events. The establishment of the beast, the intensification of, of Satan's wrath on the earth. And then verse 13, when the dragon saw he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now we're tying into what we read about in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. The persecution, it comes from Satan the devil, not just from human beings, but human beings under the influence of Satan the devil. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Again, looking at who is being persecuted here. Is this the physical descendants of, of Israel that are represented by this woman? Well, there's no protection guaranteed for them. If we look at the lens of prophecy that involves the tribes of Israel, there's punishment for them in the end time. Punishment, great punishment coming on them just before the return of Christ. That punishment persists because they persist in evil and a refusal to repent. This is different. This is the church of God suffering persecution from Satan. Not punishment from God, but persecution from Satan. And verse 14 here represents a magnificent transition where God is going to work a miraculous delivery for his people. And some of them, notice just some, are going to be protected from the remaining tribulation on the earth for those three and a half years. You might notice, if you look carefully at it, that the phrase place of safety is, is not present there in verse 14. 
it says she may fly into the wilderness to her place. The place of safety within the church of God as a, as a teaching is one that is invited, you, you could call it urban theology, like urban mythology or urban legends, right? It's invited a lot of speculation, probably because people are worried that they, they won't get to go there, that they'll have to endure this, this terrible tribulation. And, and what's more, we, we want to be part of that. We, we want to be counted worthy, as it said in Luke 21. But we really need to stick to what Scripture says about it and stay away from what Scripture doesn't say. A couple of things we notice here is that uh, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, that she might fly. Working that over in your mind sounds like she's going to have to do some of the flying, right? Not she was flown, but that she might fly doesn't seem to be some kind of miraculous transportation, maybe being miraculously led with a path clearly made, but also involves her own effort in that. If we look back at verse 6 again, it says the woman fled. The woman fled into the wilderness. This appears to be the same kind of fleeing. It's, a, it's not a migration over time. It's something that happens quickly. Happens quickly, and it's definitive. Looking at the two wings of a great eagle there, a key reference is Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4, which is where God, describing what he had done for the people of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt, says, see how I've borne you out on eagles' wings. You know, significantly, he had protected them from the plagues of Egypt while they were there, culminating in the Passover, which he passed over them, that's where we get the name. And he brought them through the, wit, wit, uh, through the wilderness, but those eagles' wings then meant that they, they went on foot. <laughs> they had to do the walking themselves. Verse 15, we'll continue reading. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Prophetically, a flood like this in prophecy, represents an army. And we know that Satan will be controlling the great armies of the beast that are ruling the whole world, and they'll go after the woman. Verse 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So it, we see, again, this is all taking place on the earth. There's no rapture to heaven here. This, you've got this, this flood going on, and the earth helping the woman by opening up and swallowing this force that's sent out after the church. But verse 17, we, we can see here this doesn't include all of the church. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, what does all this mean? Does this mean that if we're not faithful enough, we're going to have to face the horror of the tribulation? I think that's what we tend to be afraid that it means. I think in light of looking at the persecution that comes before this, really we need to be prepared for whatever God has in store for me personally. That's where our, our focus has to be. For, for us to be prepared for whatever God has in store for us personally. Verse 11, if we go back to it, I skipped over it before. Speaking of when Satan had been cast down to earth, talking about how he, he was going against the saints. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. This is true of every person in the church of God in every time and every circumstance. It's true of us today. It was true of the apostles. It's true of those who are persecuted before the tribulation. It's true of those who are, who are fleeing for protection into the wilderness with that divine protection during the tribulation, and it is true of those who live through the tribulation that are part of the church. It's true of those who die in the tribulation, for that matter. Anyone who overcomes does so by the blood of the Lamb. And how do we do that? We do that by not loving our lives to the death, no matter what form that death takes. All are tested, no matter what our life is like. And the same thing is required of every one of us, no matter when or how our test comes. The point is that we have to give up our lives to God today, or else we are in danger of giving up our eternal life. Whether that's due to the pulls of the world, like we read about in Luke, 
or the pressures of persecution and the difficulties that living our way will, will come in the end times. So we need to really ask, what is my response to God's calling? Am I taking up my cross daily? Do I know what that means? Am I sure I know what that means? I mean, do I take real action in my walk with God to repent and to continue avoiding evil and fighting against it, waging the spiritual warfare as necessary when those things come? Do we give our life completely to God, give up my will, my plans, my time, my money, doing these things for his sake in the ways that the commandments require according to the perfect will of God? Do we demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ in the way that we care for others and let the light of God shine before all men? Do we take care of people? Do we show love and outgoing concern for all? The storm is coming. It cannot be avoided. Just like when I was on the highway, nowhere to go, too late to turn back. Whether that storm for, for us is facing martyrdom, whether we're escaping in the tribulation, or whether we just get struck by lightning going down the road on the Capitol Beltway next week. We have to spiritually prepare now, right now. And anyone who does that will be ready for whatever comes. So let's give up our lives to God today and every day and endure to the end.